Good morning. We're back. Finally. Seems like we were gone forever. We're in Genesis chapter 36. 36. And we're pretty much just going to kind of read through 36 because it's a lot of names. So, you know, I'll, I'll struggle through. And then we'll get to 37 and we'll get back into more <laughs> story type stuff. Um, so this is going to be 36 is the, the genealogy of Esau and how he turns into the, the uh, nation or the, the country of Edom Edom would be even though closely related to Israel, they are not going to be the friends of Israel. They, they will turn on them. Uh, they will, instead of helping cheer on the enemies of Israel when they, whenever they're fighting or, or being conquered, their, their sin against Israel is so great in the eyes of God that in the end, there will be a total destruction of Israel, um, or not of Israel, of, of Edom. They will, the Bible tells us, be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, when Jesus comes back, when he approaches the Mount of Olives, he will have already gone and destroyed what's left of the Edomites. And that area in his robes will already be dipped in blood. Um, before he touches down on the Mount of Olives. So as he comes in, Armageddon is not even the first place that he comes with destruction. Edom will be the first place and then come to, the, to Armageddon where everybody is gathered to do battle against him. Uh, but in the meantime, you have the development here where, uh, as a record of who they are. The entire book of Obadiah, by the way, which is only one chapter, so the entire book, uh, is about the destruction and the judgment of Edom. That is what that prophecy is is all about. Anyways, <clears throat> uh, now is the uh, this is the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, uh, Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, Aholi, Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, uh, and Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nab Nabajath, the, now Ada bore Eliphaz to Esau, and Basemath bore Ruel, <coughs> and Aholabama uh, bore Ju Jesh Je <laughs> Jush and Jaal. Ja'alma, Alam, Ja'alam, and Korah. These were the sons of Esau who, uh, who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the persons of his household, his cattle, and all of his animals, and all of his goods, which he had, uh, which he had gained in the land of Canaan, and went uh, to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together, and the land where uh, they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock. All right, so this is a familiar story, right? Remember Abraham and Lot decide that the land can't support both of them, so they split and go their separate ways. Now Esau, the one who, when he finds out Jacob has tricked him and has stolen his birthright and stolen the blessing from Isaac, and really just sold his birthright for a bowl of, of stew, we see here has no inclination, no desire for this land. The, the promised land to Jacob has provided for Canaan. He's, he's gained all of these things. 
<clears throat> but he has compromised with the people, the women of Canaan, which he wasn't supposed to do. He took his wives from there. And, and then even though he's gained a lot of possessions, he leaves the, the place. There's no debate. There's no discussion. It doesn't seem anyways uh, of, you know, hey, what if I take the north and you take the south? They just decide the both of them are so great that he says, you know what? It's time for me to go. And he leaves behind all of this that he whined and cried about not having. And he, and he just goes. There's no seeking God here still in Esau's life. And even though he's at peace with Jacob, the, you know, it, it just, it, it, on one hand, it seems like he's just going to get out of the way and let Jacob have his inheritance and have the land and all that. And maybe initially, or maybe that's part of the decision making, but Esau doesn't seek God on this. He doesn't have that relationship with God. He doesn't have his place like Jacob had Bethel, right? The place he went back to where God first spoke to him where he returned and had this kind of revival, personal revival within him, where he took his family and said, this is where it all began between the God of Abraham and Isaac and myself. This is where I received the promise from God. This is where I saw him. He, he, Esau doesn't have that in the land. He doesn't have a place where he went and sought God or where God came to him and talked to him. And so he just leaves. Verse 8, so Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. And this is the genealogy of Esau, the father of the, of the Edomites in Mount Seir. These were the, the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Edah, the wife of, of Esua, and Ruel, the son of Besmoth, uh, the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were team. Timon, Omar, uh, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Now Timma, Tim, Timna was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she bore Amalek and two Eliphaz. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. Uh, these were the sons of Ruel, uh, Nahath, Zerah, Sham, Shama and Mizah. These were the sons of Besmath, Esau's wife. These were the sons of Aholibama, Esau's wife, the daughter of Anna, uh, the daughter of Zibion. Uh, she bore to Esau uh, Jehush, Ja'al, Ja'alam, and Korah. Nobody's taking their kids' names from this list of people, right? I mean, if you do, my goodness. These were the chiefs of Esau. Right? So the, now they're beginning to become a nation. Now they're beginning to get to a point where they have, in this case, chiefs or elders of the tribe that, as it is growing. Uh, these were the chiefs of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, uh, were chief Teman, chief Omar, chief Zepho, and Chief uh, Kenaz, Chief Korah, Chief Gatam, Chief Amalek. <clears throat> These were the chiefs of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. They were the sons of Ada. These were the sons of Ruos, Esau's son, Chief Nahath, uh, Chief Zerah, Chief Shaman, Shama, Sh yeah, whatever, and Chief Mizah. <laughs> These were the chiefs of Ruel. The, in the land of Edom. These were the sons of Besmath, Esau's wife. These were the sons of Aholibama, Esau's wife. Uh, chief Je Jeush, Chief Jaalam, Chief Korah. These were the chiefs who descended from Aholibama, Esau's wife, the daughter of Anna. These were the sons of Esau, who is Edom, and these were their chiefs. All right, so basically his sons are the rulers of the tribes. And it's, it, it kind of follows suit with Jacob because he has 12 sons he's going to have and they're going to be the leaders of the 12 tribes. Those tribes in Israel will always go by the name of the son of Jacob that they come from. 
So you have the tribe of Judah all throughout the Bible, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Levi, all that. And, and we'll see that as we go. <clears throat> you have the, uh, the same uh, here. with, uh, and, and it's just a, a thing with um, that, that area of the world. These were the sons of Seir, the Horite who inhabited the land, Lotan, uh, Shobal, Zib Zibion, and Anna, Dishan, Izar, and Dish Dishan. These were the chiefs of the Horites, the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. <clears throat> the sons of Lotan were Horai and, and Heman, Hema, Mom. Lotan's sister was uh, Timna. These were the sons of Shobal, Alvan, uh, Manahath, Ebal, uh, Shepho, and Onam. <laughs> These were the sons of Zibion, both Aja and Anna. These were the, this was the Anna who found the water in the wilderness as he pastured the donkeys of his father Zibion. These were the children of Anna, Dishan, and Aholi, Aholi Bama, the daughter of Anna. These were the sons of Dishan, uh, Hemdan, Eshban, Ithran, and Chiran. These were the sons of Ezer, Bilhan, Za Zaavan, and Akan. These were the sons of Dishan, Uz, and Aran. These were the chiefs of the Horites. Chief Lotan, Chief Shabal, Chief Zibion, Chief Anna, the, uh, Chief Dishan, Chief Ezer, and Chief Dishan. These were the chiefs of the Horites according to their chiefs in the land of Seir. Now these were the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before, the king, before any king reigned over the children of Israel. Bilah, the son of Beor, uh, reigned in Edom. And then uh, the name of his city was Denhan Dehaba. And when Bila died, jo Jobab, the son of Zira of Basra, uh, reigned in his place. When Joab died, uh, Jobab died, Hushman, Hushham uh, of the land of the Timonites reigned in his place. And when Husham died, Hadad, the son of Bedad, uh, who attacked Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his place. And the name of the city was Avith. Then Hadad died. Sham, uh, Shamla and Masrika uh, reigned in his place. And when Salam died, or Samla died, uh, Saul of Rehoboth by the river uh, reigned in his place. When Saul died, Baal Hanan, the son of Akbar, reigned in his place. And when Baal Hanan, the son of Akbar, died, Hadar uh, reigned in his place, and the name of his city was Pau. His wife's name was Mahetalbel, the daughter of Metred, the daughter of Misahab. <laughs> The chiefs of Esau, or, I'm sorry, these were the names of the chiefs of Esau, according to their families and their places by their names, Chief Timna, Chief Alvin, Chief Je Jethith, Chief Aholibama, Chief Elah, Chief Pinan, Chief Kenez, Chief Timan, Chief Mizbar, Chief Magdil, Chief Iram. These were the chiefs of Edom, according to their dwelling place in the land of their possession. Esau was the father of the Edomites. So, woo, yeah, right? Made it. So all of these people are descendants of Esau. Um, you know, and there, there's a lot of discussion about who descends from who in the Middle East outside of Israel. But I couldn't begin to tell you which ones actually still would be considered descendants of Ishmael, which ones would be considered descendants of Esau. Um, some of this is, is maybe, but even now today, the Israelites don't all know where. It's a pretty good guess which tribe you come from. Right? It's, not, it's so convoluted now 
is, is, would be hard for them to even know. Uh, God knows, and we know God knows, because in the, in the last days, during the tribulation time, you'll have the 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, that God will separate out from the nation to be basically prophets to Israel and to the world. And, and so God knows who belongs to who. But we really only have good guesses right now. Um, the last known Edomite, I think, or Edomites, that we would be familiar with anyways, would be the Herods. So the Herod that rebuilt the temple, that asked to be called King Herod, was actually an Edomite who reigned over, over uh, Jerusalem and that part that Rome set him in place and went ahead and gave him the title even though he wasn't really a king. Uh, but when he found out, remember when the wise men come and, and say, hey, we came to worship the new king of Israel who's just been born, and he freaks out and kills all the baby boys between you know, or under the age of three or something like that. Um, he does that. That's part of what brings the judgment as well. They, and, and he is a representative set against destroying or ruling over Israel and even blocking the the Messiah from coming. Because right? the, the wise men weren't coming just looking for a king. They came, they believed when they came, and there are other outside writings, ancient writings, I guess, that that point at that time to there, there was an expectation outside of Israel for a very important king to be born at that time. And I only can guess, and it's my guess, that that probably came through Daniel when he was the chief of the wise men in Babylon, that prophecy and that teaching would be handed down from Daniel to those he was in charge of who were not Israelites, to the, the wise men or, or whatever that were in uh, Babylon at the time. So those who would be there to advise the king. You remember he, he saved all of them. They, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He wants the, not just the interpretation of the dream, but just to make sure they're not just trying to fool him or tell him whatever he wants to hear. They have to tell him the dream as well. And they're, you know, we can't do that. Nobody's ever done that. You got to tell us what the dream is for us to know what it would mean. And he's like, nope, nope. If you can't tell me the dream, you can't give me a real interpretation, and you're all going to die. <laughs> and, and so Daniel and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, hey, give us a little bit of time. They pray, and God gives Daniel the dream and the interpretation of the dream and saves all of the wise men. And Nebuchadnezzar then sets him above every, all the wise men of the land, all the advisors of the land. Uh, and so it's my, and, it, and this is just my opinion, but it's my opinion that that would be how the, the wise men or the kings of the east, however you want to refer to those guys that would come and, and look for Jesus, and bring him the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, those guys would know because that was passed down from Daniel through the generations uh, in, in their ancient teachings. They would know to look for a sign. They would know what the sign was. And they would know to go to honor this great king that was born. Uh, if there's another way, God knows what it would be. I don't. That's just my best guess of how they would know. Um. Yeah, I mean, certainly could have been a, an angelic revelation even to those guys because there was given one after they saw Jesus. When they found Jesus, they, they went, they gave him the gifts, they worshiped. And when they were getting ready to leave, they were warned not to go back to Herod and to just leave. And, uh, and that's what sets Herod off to go in to kill all of the, all of the baby boys. But anyways, it was that family is probably the most popular or most well-known Edomite to us. <clears throat> so we get to 37. Now, we're going to get into Joseph's life. And the rest of this book is Joseph's life. And it's the preservation of Israel as a nation for sure, right, and his brothers. But it's not through good and gracious means. Right? It is through hard times. It's through unfair treatment. 
It's through abuse that God, in spite of all of that, not only preserves Joseph, but preserves his brothers, preserves the family, and begins to build this nation within Egypt. Um, there is n nothing bad said about Joseph. Only, besides Jesus, only Joseph and Daniel, they're the only two in the entire Bible where we don't see some shortfall, some thing, some sin in their life uh, that is described. They're the, on, the only two. Joseph is going to become a huge, in many ways, uh, a type of Jesus. There are so many things about his life. Some would even say, uh, I think, actually, I think it was Chuck Missler documented like over 100 hundred different details of Joseph, Joseph's life that point to Jesus, where he, he is a type of Jesus, and, a, and kind of a foreshadowing of what the Messiah would be. He's going to be put in the ground by his brothers. He's going to be persecuted and rejected by his brothers. And you can go through the New Testament and find all these verses, and I, I suggest you do it. We'll pull out some, but it's a bigger study than, than we want to try to cover on Sunday morning, I think. Unless God changes my mind. But I would encourage you to do that as you go through outside of Sunday morning and you look at the details of what we're going to go through and let it think about all the ways. You're going to, we're going to read some things. We're going to see some things that should spark a memory in us for those of us especially who have walked with the Lord for a long time and know the Gospels well, should spark in us uh, a remembrance of certain things in the New Testament that are spoken of Jesus and how Joseph plays it's played out in his life. So verse 1 says, Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger and in, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob, jo of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock uh, with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah his father's wives. Joseph brought a bad report of them to, to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than, his, than all of his children uh, because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when the brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. All right, so you would think that Jacob would know better than to show favoritism. This is what led to the division between he and Esau when they were both at home together. Isaac showed favoritism to, uh, to Esau, and Rebekah showed favoritism to, to Jacob. And it, it brought division and manipulation and lying and, and you know, all that. All that made that family dysfunctional uh, was brought because of parents showing favoritism to one child. Now, that I don't mean to get into a big parenting thing right now. Understand, if you have multiple children, somebody always thinks they're the favorite, and somebody always thinks somebody else is the favorite. And it's typically whoever's in trouble thinks somebody else is the favorite. Right? And we see here, Joseph brings a bad report about some of his brothers, the ones who were uh, from Zilpah and Bilhah. And he brings a bad report to, jo or to Jacob about his brothers. So he gets his brothers in trouble. And some people are like, oh, see, Joseph was you know, a tattletale or a narc or whatever. But God doesn't correct Joseph with this. And so I, I can assume that there was good reason, because surely, uh, you know, I've got four brothers. Surely, there was a lot that went on that didn't have to go back to Jacob. Whatever this was, and we're not giving the details of it, Joseph, being a very smart young man, realizes there's something, this, this needs to go to dad. He needs to know about this incident. incident. And so he lets him know. Well, now none of the brothers like it. 
And none of the brothers, it was already building up, right? Because of Jacob's favoritism. It says it's because he was in his old age uh, that he was born. And, and you know, there's truth to that. He's older and, and, and has this, this son. And, and, uh, and, and at, by this time, Benjamin as well. And both of these come from Rachel, the, the, the wife that, that Jacob loved more than everybody else, the one he really loved. He, he wasn't even in it for the other three, <laughs> really. Um, so there, there's division within the family because you show favoritism to a certain section of the family, a certain part of the family. When, when you again, when you have a big family, there's always there's always tension somewhere. We just spent all this time at, at camp where it's a big family uh, thing, and and there are within the big families that are there, and there are big families there with lots of cousins, some who know each other well, some who barely know each other, and and there is my favorite cousin, and there is my least favorite cousin, and. Well, oh, not mine because it's not not my family is not the one established there. But <laughs> anyhow, there's that. Even if you go to a family reunion, you see this group sits over here, this group sits over here, and there might be a little fringe intermingling that goes on in there. But for the most part, the popular ones in the different groups are are holding their their spots. They're, they're courts, right? And everybody else is just kind of in and around the favorite uncles or whatever it is. Whatever it is. In this, when you're, when you're in the one camp all the time, this is hard to, to keep the peace. These guys look so down on Joseph, it says there, that they can't even speak peaceably to him. So if they say anything to him at all, it's a, it's a jab. If they address him at all, it's not good, it's not kind, ever. The, the tension has grown so much that there is no peace with Joseph as far as they're concerned. This coat of many colors has got a, a bunch of different interpretations. Was it a coat that literally had different colors to it? Or was it a coat that had long sleeves where those who would be working would have short sleeves? Which would meant that he was set by his father in a position to be kind of the administrator or the executive, if you will, over the brothers who were doing all the work, feeding the flocks and caring for the flocks. Um, but Joseph was held close to dad. And, you know, if there were family secrets given to Joseph, if they, you know, whatever. If there were ways to do business, if he was rubbing elbows with somebody to do business outside of the family, Joseph maybe was there to see all of that and, and making connections and all that, right? The mover and the shaker, and everybody else was just the worker. And again, how much, I mean, it, there's the admission here that, jo, or that Jacob did show favoritism to Joseph. But when we become bitter, when we look and, and with envy at somebody else's life. It, it Sometimes if we let it get to us, it doesn't matter if we're working or walking in our giftedness. If what they have is better, then they have the better life. They, why don't we have that? Right? Why hasn't God done this for me? Why isn't God? And we're not content where we're at and where God has us. And there's no contentment in this family. And it's not fostered by Jacob. Right? And, but all of these, these other brothers, make a decision. And, and we've seen this building, right? We're going to see they're going to be in, feeding the flocks in Shechem. What happened in Shechem? Remember the last time they were in Shechem? The, the brothers, the, the uh, was it? Simeon and Judah that went and, and killed all of the men in Shechem and set them all up and because of what happened to Dinah and, and there's just 
no, no contentment in this family for where they're at. And I, I maybe need to observe this more as I go through these stories, but it seems to me the farther away you get from Abraham, the less content everybody is. Isaac never seems to be as content as Abraham was to just walk with God and to go where God has told him. Now, was Abraham completely content all the time? No, nope. he had uh, Sarah and, and, he, and he had Ishmael and he had Isaac and he had, you know, all of the conflict that was in his family. That, w- that was part of it. But he always went back to being content with God to the point where he would talk with God more. And, and Isaac seems to be less content, but we see less conversations with God in Isaac's life. And Jacob seems to be less content than Isaac, but we see less conversations with in longer time periods, or at least longer time periods between the conversations that God would have than with Abraham or with Isaac. And certainly the boys, the 12 uh, brothers here, the 12 sons, less conversations with God and greater discontent in their life. They're not able to look around and say, well, this is where God has me, so this is where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, I'm going to do what I'm going to do to glorify and honor him. I'm going to worship the God of Jacob. Jacob uprooted all of them from Shechem, moved them all to Bethel and said, this is where it all began. Get rid of your idols. They all got rid of their idols. They have an idea of who God is. They've heard the stories. They know what he's done in Jacob's life. They know now how from uh, from Ur, from Uncle Laban, and uh, how God prospered their father there, how in spite of all the trickery, all the manipulation, God still worked in his father's life. And Jacob recognized that and brought them back into the land. But in spite of all of that, they are not content. And, and this discontent, this inability to be at peace with God means they have no peace within themselves. And there is no peace then within the family. And there be no real peace around them. And rather than saying, we need to seek God, rather than saying to Jacob, what do we do? How do we function better as a family, how do we function better? How, take us to God. Instead of doing that, they're going to handle everything on their own, and it's all going to go bad. Right? And it's all going to be out of control, and it's all going to, except for that when you back out from this picture, you see that there is still one actually in control. And Joseph is going to say to his brothers, in the future, when there's a reunion with them, what you intended for evil, God has taken and made and used for good. In Romans 8, 28, what does it say? All things work together for good for those who are the called and according to God's purpose. All things, good and bad, hard and easy, they all work out for God's purpose, for the good. Right? All of this out of control that we see in our communities, in our nation, in the nations around the world, all of this is working toward a good. It, God is not out of control. It seems like the world's out of control, but it is all falling into place. And we have a God who loves us so much that he told us what was going to happen ahead of time. And some people will look at somebody like me or hear somebody like me and say, oh, you're just this doomsday or you're all, all about the end and you can't see anything good. No, I see the good. The good is yet to come. The ultimate good is coming and I, I can't wait for it to be here. Does that mean I can't be content now? No, I can still, I mean, I don't know. I want to give the illusion that I'm always content. I'm not always content. 
And sometimes I get caught up in the garbage that's going on around us. And it gets the better of me. And my emotions get out and, and get out of control. But I've seen enough of these stories and I've read the Bible enough and I've taught it enough to know that if I go to God, the peace comes back. The joy is still there. The contentment then, even in the midst of wickedness and evil, is still there. I can still have it. I can still function in this. And God will do what God will do in my life. And, and sometimes there's hard things. There's things I don't like. There's things that I look and say, I don't see how this benefits me. But if I back out and I say, God, I don't know what you're doing. But I know it's got to be for my good. And it certainly is for your plan. To bring ultimately glory and honor to you. And that's what I want. And that's where the contentment comes back. There is no peace in this house that we're looking at now. But we can see the shortcomings of everybody, right? And so without pointing a finger at Jacob or at any of the brothers and say, how could you? We look at this and say, Lord, don't let this be our home. Show me what to do. And if it's, if it's already been full of discontent, if it's already, you know, listen, I can remember when my parents, I can remember it clearly in ninth grade, a, a, a kid that I knew, not well, but I knew him, started acting different, very quiet, very subdued. He wasn't anybody I would even want to really be friends with because he wasn't a nice kid most of the time. But he, he changed. And somebody said, his parents are getting a divorce. And I can remember watching him walk down the hallway in school and saying, man, Lord, thank you that my family, uh, that'll never happen to me. Right? I had the memory of my dad kneeling at an altar with me, leading me to the Lord, raised in church. My dad at one point wanted to be a pastor, but then, but then wasn't. And it was only a couple of months later when all of a sudden my family, the news came to me. My mom and dad actually were. I was going to be just like that kid walking down the hallway. Here's the difference. He didn't know God. And I did. That didn't make my life better. That didn't make that instance better. That didn't make my, my, the rest of my freshman year better. It didn't make the rest of my high school career better. It was all hard. There was always this nagging in the back of my head. This isn't how this is supposed to be. It's not right before God, but why in the world did it happen? And I knew, I knew it wasn't my doing. I knew it wasn't God's doing. This was an abandonment of what we were taught. But I also knew I had a decision to make because everything that I had been taught was now on the line. Everything that, that I had been taught had been abandoned by the people that taught it to me. I had to make the decision. Was what I knew about the Bible, even at that age, at 14 years old, was what I knew about God true in spite of them? Or was I going to walk just like them? Would I follow in their footsteps? And I wish I could say, oh, no, man, you know what? I chose God and went on my way and everything was bright and shiny. And, and I didn't. I had my moments. To be just like the people who disappointed me. And, and yet, you know, I come out and when Tracy and I start talking about getting married, we talked about all of this stuff. Her parents being divorced, my parents being divorced. We were never going to do that. We were never going to say that. And yet, but two and a half, three years into it, almost.
but God. And we only had hope then. We had one child. And some people would say, well, it's only one. Thank God you did it before and broke it up before you had a, a whole bunch. Nope. One child being hurt was too much for us. And so we stuck it out. We stayed together. We began to work back toward that. God healed it. We went by. My wife had to be told by God to be quiet and leave me alone. And believe me, the things that he showed me and that he said to me were way louder than anything that she ever had said. And it was because in the middle of all that mess, I still knew he was real. I still knew he was there. I still knew that this was true. I still knew it. I didn't say, like all these people are doing today, oh, I don't believe that anymore. I'm not a Christian anymore. These people are deconstructing their faith. John tells us in 1 John, they've left us because they never really were part of us. And I, I couldn't get away from the truth. It was like it was something that haunted me. It wasn't something that brought peace in my life at that time when I wasn't walking with God. I have, I have said prodigals are the most miserable people on the face of the planet. When you know the truth, when you believe it's true, when you know you've committed your life to the Lord and you're not walking in it, you're walking away from it, you're doing everything you know is wrong. You're miserable and you know it. And most of the time, they're not continuing in that lifestyle because they're still hoping, one day I'm going to find something better than God. It's usually because they fall into the trap of, what have I done? I can't go back. Until they get so desperate, they say, well, you know what? Even if I can't go back and be a son or a daughter, I'll go back and be a servant. And that's what the prodigal did, right? In that story, he said, my father's servants have it better than I do. I'm going to go back and just be a servant. And that was really what I thought. When, when I thought if I've lost my salvation, if I can't, if, if, I'm, if I'm done, if I have doomed myself, I'm still going back and I'm going to live what I believe even if it's not for me anymore, not offered to me anymore for the sake of my daughter. To find out when you come back and you come back to the father, he's still your father. Joseph is about to <clears throat> enter into a life that most of us would feel like we couldn't survive. In verse 5 it says, Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers. And they hated him, hated him even more. Okay. Now, I have always, going through this, and you listen to other pastors teach on this, you're going, why? Why would you say anything to them? It's like sticking your finger in their eye, Joseph. What is wrong? Why would you do this? And he, so he, he kind of pleads with them. He says, so he said to them, please hear this dream which I have, which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall we indeed reign, or shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more uh, for the dream and for his words. 
Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What? What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down uh, to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. All right, so my first inclination is just like anybody else's. Why are you saying these things? Why are you telling them these dreams? I could understand taking Jacob aside and just saying, hey, dad. I had this dream, I'm not sure, you know, it seems to me something big is coming and, you know, but no, he's going to tell his brothers, you know, we're, we're out there in the harvest, my sheep stands up, yours gather around me and bow down. And, and it's obvious to all of them, including, I would think, Joseph, the meaning of this you're going to have dominion over us. You're going to rule over us. Now, here he stands with a coat that says, you don't have to do the hard work, and they already have to do the hard work. And so, maybe they don't trust that he actually had the dream. Maybe they just think, hey, you are already think you're in this position, and you're already trying to lord over us, and now you're trying to make it seem like it's something from God. And he has the second dream. Now the second dream should remind you of Genesis chapter 12. I mean Revelation chapter 12. Where you have the vision that John has. Uh, and you can go and, and you can listen to our teaching on that. Or you can, I would encourage you to obviously go and, and read it yourself. But it's the setup of the whole nation. This isn't the setup of one person over 11 persons or in the case of the second dream uh, the, the 13 in, in uh, the mother and father it's not that it's this establishment of a nation and at this point even though the Messiah is not going to come through Joseph he's going to come through Judah okay? but as this nation is established and through Joseph, it's going to be established. It represents the entire nation of Israel, not just the 12 brothers. They can't see this plan. Joseph really probably can't even see how this is going to play out. I mean, obviously, he has no idea how this is going to play out. It's not going to play out in a good way, initially. But none of them knows how we're going to get to this point. And the brothers are rejecting the whole thing. So here's Joseph with a word from God to his brothers. Both he and the word are rejected. Remind you of anybody? What is it? Jesus said, the Bible tells us, he came into his own and his own uh, would not receive him. Jesus came with a message for Israel. And before he dies, he ends up looking out over Jerusalem and says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, as he's weeping, how I long to gather you uh, under my wings as a hen gathers his chicks or her chicks, but you would not. You know, this is, again, for us anyways, it's a type of the Messiah, uh, uh, an acting out of the prophecy. But there's another thing that strikes me here, and, and, some, and it's, it comes inspired, I think, because of myself and other pastors who are like, why would you do this? Why would you say this? Why wouldn't you just keep your mouth shut and keep it to yourself? Think about all the prophets in the Bible. All given words from God. Whether it's a, a prophetic word about the Messiah to come or whether it was a word against Israel at the time. And, and basically, here's your error. Here's where you're wrong. 
here's how you straighten it up. If you'll do that, you're back in, 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 in line with me. If you don't, then this destruction or this is going to happen to you. You're going to go into captivity, right? Moses, as they're going into the promised land, one of the last things he tells them, right? If you will follow the things that I have written, that God has had me written, right for you, then all will be well. You'll prosper in the land. If you don't, you will be removed from the land. You will be give, gone into captivity. Right? And, and what happened? They fell into idolatry. They end up in captivity. They move away from God. God moves them out of the land for a time. In the Bible, when a prophet is given a word, he's not able to hold on to it. Something about these dreams was impressed upon Joseph to have to tell and have to speak it out. Even though it wasn't going to be received well. He had to know. They're not saying anything nice to him ever at all at this point. So to go to the 12 or to the, to the 11 and all at one time and say, hey, this is my dream. And... and it's an obvious dream that they're able to interpret. And then to go with the second dream to them again and with Jacob. Something about the dream and God giving him this word. There was an impression that he couldn't keep silent about it. He wasn't allowed to keep silent about it. He's given a prophetic dream and a prophetic word and he's every time when you go through the the minor prophets to the major prophets when they're given a word they're told you go and you tell you, you tell everything Ezekiel's told you, you tell them everything I tell you to tell them everything I give to you because if you don't their blood will be on your head right you, you tell them and if they reject it, then it's on them. But if you receive the word and are silent, then it's on you. And I think Joseph was in the same position. He's a prophet at this point. He's given a direction, a word, a dream by God. And obviously it's interpretation. And he's basically, he, he can't not tell them what's coming. And it says his brothers envied, envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. That part right there about Jacob, even though Jacob has said, what are you doing? What are you thinking? You know, but Jacob keeps the matter in mind. Remember when when things were said about Jesus as a baby, when the shepherds came, when in the temple, Anna and Simeon make a big deal about, about Jesus as he's being brought in to be dedicated at the temple. It was say of Mary, she kept these things in her heart. Even when she didn't understand, she remembered. She kept them in her heart. She held on to them. Jacob is probably thinking, this isn't a good idea, but there's something about this. Something about your dream. And, and, and keeps the matter in mind. Which means he just thought on it. He's been given the direction. Right? The, the promises of God to Abraham and to Isaac and to, and to himself. About a great nation coming from them. Maybe he's thinking. This has something to do with the establishment of this, of this family turning into a nation and not just a family. He's contemplating. He's, he's considering everything. The others are just like, this is ridiculous. And, and now I, I can't stand you even more. <laughs> and then verse 12, and I don't know that we'll get all the way through this, but probably not. Then his brothers went to feed their flocks in Shechem. Here we are. 
back in Shechem. And you might be thinking, that's a pretty bold move. You go back to Shechem and all these people around you are wanting to, you know, possibly, I mean, they kind of fled Shechem. Jacob was like, you guys did this. Now I feel like I got to hurry up and get out of here before there are other tribes come and attack us. They aren't afraid. They're not even afraid of their past. They go, they go back to their past to feed their father's flock. It's, I, I understand wanting to go back to our friends, wanting to go back to where we came from to witness to people. But we also need to understand that those places, those people, unless they give their heart to the Lord, cannot be in the place they used to be in our lives. They can't be the place where we go to feed. Our, our best friends, the ones that advise us in life, should not be, is again, my opinion, should not be unbelievers. Because they will not advise us according to the word of God. And even if their advice seems good, if it's not according to the word of God, you have to reject it. Now, we, we might love the place. We might want to go back. We might, you know, I just, I've heard, a, <laughs> I've heard of a lot of people falling because of, of, being in a temptation and, and yielding to that temptation to go back to an old life. And Roger, I think it's Roger in Kalamazoo there, it tells the story of a friend of his who was a pastor. Had this guy in his, pa in, in his church give his heart to the Lord, radically saved, drug addict, walked into his office with a bag of drugs and set him on his desk said I've been set free turned around and walked out the problem was that pastor came from that same past and now he's sitting with that temptation on his desk and he gave into it now what would put it in anybody's mind to bring your drugs to your pastor is beyond me so if you are struggling with that, don't bring them to me. You can come and talk about it and confess it all you want to, but don't. And not because I've had this wild past, but just don't. I don't want it. Get rid of it the way you're supposed to get rid of it. Just be careful about going back. Their hearts are not right. They go back to Shechem. There's, a, there's an arrogance there, I think, that takes them back to Shechem to feed the flock. Now, they've become so big that Esau moves out of the country. Right? He moves out of the land of Canaan altogether. So there's still that fear, and we know from the previous chapters, there was a fear of Jacob that had come over all of them. So obviously the other, there's a security there because of the actions of the other tribes uh, that they feel secure enough to go. Verse 13 says, And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said, here I am. <coughs> Again. I, I'm a, the father saying to the son, I want you to go, I want you to do this for me. You go to your brothers and, and see, make sure everything's well. He doesn't hesitate. He just says, here I am. Reminds me of the story of Samuel being called by God at a very young age. Right? And he goes into Eli and says, did you call me? And he says, it wasn't me. Go back to bed. And he sends you back to bed like 30 times. In the, or, but eventually Eli says, listen, if you hear the voice again, just say, you know, your servant is here, Lord. Or, or something to that matter. Similar to this. Here I am. Your servant's listening. And Mary, again, when she gets the news from Gabriel, you're going to be 
a, a mom. You're going to bring the, the Messiah is going to come through you. Without knowing a man, you're going to have this happen. And her response is, let it be done to your servant, as you've said, your maid servant, as, as you've said. Knowing that that was going to bring hardship on her life. To bring the Messiah into the world was going to bring a hardship on her life. She would be rejected by family, possibly by Joseph. At that point, she didn't know. And that we know was Joseph's intent when he found out. Until the angel came to Joseph and said, yeah, no, she's telling you the truth. Right? We know when they go to Bethlehem to have the child, there's not a family member in Bethlehem that will take them in. It's not just that the inn is full. Nobody in Bethlehem that knows them will take them in. Her reputation is gone. Jesus would even face the accusation, we know who our father is, the Pharisees would say to him. So it's something that follows even into Jesus' ministry. So 30-some years and Mary and Jesus still have this setting out in front of them. But she would know before it happens. And let it be to me, right? Let, let your word, what you have said, be done to me, your maidservant. And Joseph is, again, I mean, when you have the, the first inclination would be, really, you want me to go that far away, just me, by myself, to my brothers who hate me? Don't we have a servant we could send and find out about him instead of me? But he doesn't. He just says, here I am. I'm ready to go. It's like there's always some hope in Joseph. This is going to get better someday. Right? Dad has sent me. Surely today, this will be the day. They'll change their heart. They'll change their mind, at least toward Dad, maybe toward me. Let me go. I'll go. I'll go do it. So wants to do what the Father has him to do. And again, Jesus would always say, I am not here to do my will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And so surely the word that I have coming that I'm bringing, the message I'm bringing to my brother comes from my father. So they can't hold that against me. Verse 13 says, Then he said to him, Please go and see if it is well with your brothers and, and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he, sent, and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him and there he was wandering in the field and the man asked him, saying, What are you seeking? And so he said, to him, said I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their, their flocks. And the man said, They have departed from here, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Or Dothan. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said uh, to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some wild beast devoured him. We shall see uh, what will become of this dreamer. So they've set their hearts against Joseph to kill him. They don't care for his life. They don't want his life. And even before he gets there, the conspiring begins. Right? The, the plan begins to form. Let us do this. Let's do that. The anger, the venom, the hate is boiling up inside. To the point where there is no way we're going to get along. There, there is no reconciling this. The only way out of this is to kill him, to cut him off, to get rid of him. That's the only way. And we'll just tell dad, a wild beast got him. We'll take that pretty little coat he's got, we'll muddy it all up, we'll dirty it all up, we'll bloody it all up. And we'll say, a wild beast got him. In verse 21, but Reuben heard it. And he delivered him out of their hand and said, Let us not kill him. 
And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, uh, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him that he might deliver him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. Is this because he loves Joseph? No, that's because Reuben, the oldest, is out of his place, out of favor with dad because he had slept with one of dad's wives, one of the handmaids. So he's already shown himself to, to not be a good person. So he's trying to get back in the good graces of dad. This doesn't have anything to do with wanting to do good for, for Joseph. And so the manipulation, even among the brothers, the lying to one another. Just throw him in this pit over here. Don't kill him. we we'll just put him in the pit. We'll decide what to do with him. All the while intending, when they're off with the flocks or when they're asleep or whatever, he's going to pull him out of the pit. He's going to hustle him back to Jacob and save his life and get Jacob's favor back on him. So, so it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit and the pit was empty and there was no, no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they, lift, uh, then they lifted their eyes and looked and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing uh, spices, balm, myrrh, on their way uh, to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah uh, said to his, to his brothers, what profit is there if we, if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hands be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. The Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph uh, to Egypt. Then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. And he returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? And so... They sell him to the slave traders. The 20 pieces of, sh of, of silver is the price of a slave. That's what they paid. Or that's what they took. Uh, for their brother. It is not a great price. It's not a, a good price. It's just, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll take what we can get. Betrayed for a price in silver. Who else was betrayed for a price in silver? Who else was lowered down into the ground? All of these things, details that foreshadow Jesus. Put in, taken out. Um, and then you have Reuben that wishes, it, you know, he, he still had the intent. He was going to pull him out, but he's gone for a while. And these guys make the decision while he's gone. <clears throat> And he says, and this is why I think there, there was no real care about Joseph. This was all about getting back in the good graces of Jacob. Because he says, the lad is no more and where shall I go? What am I going to do? I'll never be in the favor of, of dad again. And this was my shot to get back in as the head of the family. To have done his, uh, his duty as the oldest. To take care of the, the youngest of the group then, there. And I keep saying the 11. Benjamin's not with these guys. Benjamin's younger than Joseph. So it's the 10 that are, are against him. Verse 31 says, So they took Joseph's tunic and killed a goat, uh, uh, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, uh, we have found this. Do, uh, do you know where or do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. 
And Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all of his sons and all of his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I shall go down into my grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of, of Pharaoh's, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. So Jacob, things are not going to get better between Jacob and his sons. He's decided the rest of his life he's going to be in mourning. He's going to mourn until the day he dies. Nobody's going to be able to comfort him. Kind of ironic though, isn't it? Fools his dad with a goat, and now he's been fooled with a goat. And again, we see the, the continuation of the family traits of manipulation and lying. And, and here, here you have these, these boys let their dad take the guilt of what he thinks happened to Joseph on himself. Right? There, there is no, couldn't you have protected him? As far as Jacob knows, this happened before he got to them. Or maybe when he was on his way back. But they don't say, oh, no, we found him, or none of that. Or, hey, he was with us, and then he wandered away. They don't do anything to console their father. They just let him take it all, all the, all the uh, guilt and responsibility for Joseph's death on himself. He doesn't even ask any questions. He just immediately goes to, what have I done? And maybe, maybe some of us need to know. We shouldn't always jump to the conclusions that the failures of our children are our fault. They make their decisions. And especially if we've trained them well. Unfortunately, sometimes they take that training and they use it in a way that's not God. And in the, there's nothing more we could have done but to show them the love of God, to, to teach them how to be godly and what they do with their relationship with God or whether they have one or not is not on us. And I'm not, you know, in some, in some cases, yeah. When, when parents don't do that, when they don't put the time and effort into teaching and training their children, yep, you bear some responsibility for what they do. But when you have, When you've tried to, to, whether it's using instances of your own life or being able to point to things in the world and say, don't go there, don't do that, don't be that. When you opened up your Bible and you said, this is what God says about this, and you've taught them the ways of God, and they still make the wrong choices and they still walk away and they still have nothing to do with God, and sometimes... Nothing to do with you. It's not always our fault. We've taught them to make the decisions. When we've taught them the right decision and the wrong decision. And why one is right and why one is wrong. And, you know, we, we don't go as far as Joseph as long, or Jacob as long as they're still alive, but Jacob thinks he's dead. But I, I've sat with many parents going, what else could I have done? I don't know what else I could have done. Surely there had to be something I did, something I did wrong, someplace that I failed. I and they start doing the Jacob thing and taking it all on themselves. And 
speaking from experience, we can't do that. We're going to let our hearts get hard. And, and it's one thing to mourn for those who are not walking with the Lord, who have refused. And until we take our last breath, we hope for them that someday they will come and, and give their heart to the Lord. But they have the same choices that everybody else has. They have the same understanding that there is a God to, to seek after and to go after. Just like everybody else that came into the world. So whether you're here or whether you are listening to this some other time, you cannot bear all the responsibility for your children's choices and decisions. Jacob's days would not be really good and wonderful until he's reunited with Joseph. until they get back in, or get into the land of Egypt. And, and then we see Jacob kind of rise to the occasion, finally in his life. And certainly in this situation where you think they're dead, and if I hadn't sent them there, if I hadn't sent him to you, if I hadn't done this, if I hadn't done that, surely he would still be here. It's all my fault. There's a lot to say about that. Unless you guys want to sit here for another hour, we're not going to go down that trail right now. It's all in God's hands. Nothing surprises our God. And even when bad things happen, He doesn't stop being good. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And let that bring comfort if you need it. Today, tomorrow, whenever. Let that bring comfort. When you, and, you know, say a lot, I keep rambling, feel like I'm rambling now. Let's pray. <clears throat> well, Lord, we just thank you for your word, for your willingness to show us the shortcomings of, of those who really are great heroes of the faith. And Lord, for taking us through even this life of a, and, and time in someone's life where things do not seem to be fair toward them, toward Joseph. And yet we see how you work because we see and we know the whole story. We see how you are going to work in his life and how you are going to hold his heart and maintain his heart. And so Lord, we ask that in the day that we live and in the evil that we see, that you would hold our hearts. Lord, you have even prophesied that in the last days the love of many would grow cold. And so, Lord, again, hold our hearts so that that does not happen to us. Keep us close to you. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.